You may say, well, wait a minute, I don't mind my mom and dad, they, they own cars, they got a nice house, etc., etc. Believe me, you can have a tornado come through, you can burn your house, you can have a lot of things happen that you really don't know. You own one thing, it's your integrity. The beauty of integrity is nobody can take it from you. Nobody can come up to you and say, I'm going to take it from you. They just can't do that. The trouble is, you can give it away. And when you give it away, I can't tell you how much trouble you're going to be. It's precious to you. It's a precious, precious thing. Don't ever give your integrity away. You know, I look at you all in this room and the blessings you're given by being at this school. And I look at some really smart individuals. You obviously got brains. You obviously have some vision of where you want to go. A lot of you are really good looking. Some of you aren't. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you know, those, to be very honest, all those traits, those traits are gifts. They're gifts. If you're, if you're a religious person, you know, they're gifts from your God. If you're not religious, they come from your environment or they come from how you were raised. But they're gifts. Character is a choice. You're not given character, it's a choice. You've got to choose to be a man or a woman of character. And you do that, you build your character by making very hard decisions daily, weekly, or monthly. I don't mean, am I going to have Pop-Tarts for breakfast, okay? That's not the kind of decision I'm talking about. I'm talking about those decisions that test your character, that test your selflessness, your moral courage, and your integrity. Decisions that make your, your hands sweaty when you know you got to make it, or your stomach starts to churn. But if you make enough of those tough decisions and you make them in the right manner, you're going to build this tremendous reservoir of strength that you'll be able to tap into when the tough times come. And you'll draw on that reservoir and you'll make right decisions based on your strength of character. And you'll be victorious. I promise you, you will be victorious. Now I know a lot of you are probably thinking, yeah, you, you're probably right, Joe K, but I know a lot of people who are sleazeballs, who aren't, don't have character, that aren't selfless, that don't have moral courage, or they don't have a sense of integrity. I know politicians who are sleeping with their secretaries. I know athletes who are taking performance enhancing drugs. I know, you know, we all know. The difference is, their supposed victories, they're never sweet. They never ever stand the test of time. How many of these athletes that are taking performance enhancing drugs are going to have asterisks by their names? Their victories do not stand the test of time. And their victories never ever serve to inspire anybody. And as young men who are going to be leaders of this nation, you're in the inspiration business. That's what you do. You're going to inspire ordinary people to do extraordinary things for our nation. That's what Boys Latin graduates are going to do. You're going to inspire ordinary people to do extraordinary things for our nation. What will inspire? What has inspired you? Who's inspired you? Your parents? Your grandparents? A great professor, a wonderful coach. Think about them and then ask yourself, what is it about them that inspires me? And I can tell you, it's going to be their character. 
that you can trust them, that you know that they're looking out for your welfare, that you, they, you know that when the chips are down, they've got the moral courage to do the right thing. That's what's inspired. Character is so important. And if you're raised, it becomes even more important because you're at the stage where you're going to make some of you, some of you already made it, one of the most important decisions of the rest of your life, and that is where you're going to go to college, and from then, what is it that I want to do in life? And that decision marks the first day for the rest of your life. And you want that decision based on your character. How am I going to use my character to better myself and to better those around me? Don't ever, ever let anybody limit you. Don't ever let anybody limit you. Uh, I, I go around and I talk to people, I said, how many people here, and I'll go with you all, how many people here have had your mom and dad or your professors or somebody say, the sky's the limit? Has anybody ever heard that? Jay, come on, hey. Well, maybe they don't use it anymore. The sky's the limit. I was told all the time, the sky's the limit, the sky's the limit. I tell my students, don't ever tell me the sky's the limit. Don't tell me the sky's the limit. Don't believe the sky's the limit when their footprint's on the moon. When their footprint's on the moon. The point is, limiting yourself is, is a terrible distraction on who you can be and should be. If you walk away with anything today, walk away with the sense of the importance of character, the sense that you don't let anybody define you, in the sense that you don't let anybody limit you. Because somebody in this audience, or an audience just like this, is going to find the cure for cancer. You laugh, you scoff, you say, no way. Somebody's going to find a cure for cancer. It may be somebody here. Somebody is going to find an economic system that will work fairly for everybody in this nation and hopefully everybody in the world. Somebody can do that. It could be you. Somebody in this room can sing or dance on the stage of the Kennedy Center and do remarkable things and make us all proud. And hopefully somebody in this room is going to find a follow-on to Google. Make yourself billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. And remember Boys Lab. <laughs> That's an advertisement. <laughs> the point is, you all are at a threshold in your life where you can really do some neat things and have fun doing it. College is fun. College is fun. It's hard work, but it's fun. It's fun. Go into it, not with apprehension, but with a desire to move forward and take the step that's gonna change your life. For those of you who are coming up, whether you're middle school, freshmen, sophomores, or juniors, take advantage of boys laughing. Take advantage of it. Drain it for everything it's got. Suck everything you can out of your professors. Leave them limp rags <laughs> when you graduate. You have them need you know, three months of bedtime because you've just picked their brain till they have a little brain left. Believe me, you'll be thankful you did. And guess what? They will be too. They will be too. Now let me stop now. You've heard my background. I've been
been in, uh, I've been a surfer, okay? I've been in the military. I've worked under three presidents. I've been in a bank. I've been in professional sports. So I'm going to open the floor up to any questions you all might have. If you if you have something that I don't know, then guess what? You're going to get an honest answer. I don't know. I'll try to find out for you. I'll send a, I'll send an email uh, to somebody at the school and say, hey, it was a question I was asked. I didn't know the answer. Here's what I think. So, any questions? Any questions? Come on, gang. Yes, sir. There you go. Have you ever been shot? The question was, have I ever been shot? The answer was, yes. <laughs> I was shot in the stomach. And I was shot through the believe it or not, the armpit, which makes for a lousy cross goalie now, I'll tell you that. But, uh, yes. What else? Come on, Gad. Yes, in the back there. I'll repeat the answer. Okay, what was the name? Uh, his real name, I can't tell because I, I, I know the family very well and they just, so we, we call him Lance Corporal Gray. His name is down on the wall, though, I can tell you that. Yes, sir? Where did you Pardon me? Where did you get the Purple Heart? Well, that Purple Heart is the same answer as when you got wounded. In other words, I got one purple heart for being shot in the stomach and one in the shoulder. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, what led me to join the Marine Corps instead of the Air Force? Uh, probably a lot of reasons why Boys Lat has a great lacrosse program because Boys Lat has a great academic program because and why you're here, because you want to go to the place where you think is the best. You know, I thought, and I still believe, the United States Marine Corps is the world's finest fighting organization, and I wanted to be part of the world's finest. Now, that doesn't take anything away from the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. They are great, and I love them to death. But at the end of the day, I had to make a choice, just like you all make a choice, and I chose the Marine Corps. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Where did you find the courage to change? It seems as if you had many paths that yeah. I admire and respect the fact that you changed. Yeah. And I didn't know squat about any of them. I mean, uh, I, I've never been a banker in my life. You know, there's somebody, Franco Tennessee, here. He was a great man. Frank's down there. He forgot more about banking than I knew, and he was with me in Europe. Uh, I just always believed that I could do anything. I, I didn't let anybody limit but I, you know, I, I said I'm not going to be limited. I knew what I wanted to try and I wanted to try it. Uh, that's not to say that I didn't have a lot of problems along the way. When I went into banking, I, when I first got to Europe, um, where our offices were in Chester, England, and I got everybody in that bank that was a leader around me, and I looked him in the eye and I said just what I said to Frank. I said, you all have forgotten more about banking than I know. I need your help. If we're gonna be good, I need your help. And once they realized that I was open to listen to what they had to say and to, to follow as best I could what they thought was the right way to go, balance with my own understanding of, of finances, that we'd be okay. We ended up being okay. I, I just, I guess my my belief is that I just wanted to do different things, and I, I never felt that I couldn't do them. I mean, look at me. I'm five foot five and a half. I'm, I'm on football. I'm, you know, it's a lousy team, but I mean, I can help them. I, I've been to every combine for the last nine years. I've been to every draft day. I'm into that. Uh, I didn't know squat. I've never played football in my life. Uh, you can do anything you put your mind to. The only thing that will keep you from not doing anything you put your mind to is yourself. 
Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. You have a very interesting story. Have you ever thought about writing? The question is, if I, I have an interesting story, have I ever thought about writing a book? And the answer is, I've thought about it. I don't have time to write a book. i got too many things to do in life. I'm loving life. Hey, love life. This is not the dress rehearsal. Does anybody think this is a dress rehearsal? You think this is a dress rehearsal? No way, man. This is not the dress rehearsal. Love it. Love it. Eat it up. It's great. Yes, sir. What shoe you get here on Navy Cross? What did you do to get here? I didn't get a Navy Cross. I got a silver star. What did I do to get a silver star? Like just about everything that I do, it was probably a stupid thing. To not, you know, you ruin it. You ruin it because you're stupid. You get medals because you're stupid. You, you see a thing that, it, that you would normally not react to, and all of a sudden you get caught up in the, the whole effort. And you go out there and pull somebody off of a battlefield, and they say, gee, what a horrible thing that you didn't know. And at the end, you're sitting there and you've stained your pants, okay? And you say, holy mackerel, what did I just do? Yes, yes, sir. How long did it take you to become a general in the Marine Corps? Okay, I got I entered the Marine Corps in 1964, and I was at the White House in 1988 when I got uh, told that I was going to be a, a, my first promotion to flag. Right? So that's that's you know close to the quarter of a century. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have two parts. First, what made you fall in love with the Birmingham Southern? And also, what's your favorite part of being college president? Okay, the, the first question is what made me fall in love with Birmingham Southern? The second was what's my favorite part of being a college president? I'll take the second part first the students. I love them. We're there because of the students. My wife and I have been married for 50 years. She's moved 32 times. Her first move on that campus was into a student dorm. We live in a student dorm for 14 months, 600 square feet, one closet. Man, who got the closet? <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. I came back from the office the second day I was there. She'd been to Walmart, okay? She bought these plastic milk cases, you know, the carton life things. Oh my, the girl in the red, my shirts were in the white. I mean, it was 14 months in a, in a very, very small dorm room. Uh, but we did it because we wanted to send a signal that we love young people. I don't get paid there. I've had a paycheck since I've been there. I, I'm uh, just halfway through my junior year. I got a 3.12 cube. Not very good. I got to work hard. I got to work hard. Uh, the first, what brought me, why I chose Birmingham Southern, the first was the students. Uh, we, when you're nominated to be a college president, you, you go through a, a rigmarole where they interview you, you interview them, you, they, they take you around the campus and they show you all these things. And so I did that in all those schools. And then I came to Birmingham Southern, like I said, I'd never been to Alabama in my life. I was there one day, friend said, go take a look at this school on the hilltop called Birmingham Southern. My wife and I went there. We did exactly what we did at Davidson and Franklin Marshall and University of Washington. We met with students. We were secret shopping. They didn't know. We went to the cafeteria, we bought the cab, and just sat down with a bunch of students and started talking to them. Talked to faculty, talked to the athletic department. You know, I, I talked to two or three coaches. I looked at all the facilities, came back to the car. And again, you know, I'm, I'm passionate to tell you we're Christians. My wife got in the car and she said, honey, this place is remarkable. And like a good husband, I said, well, what do you mean? And she says, this is it. This is where we're supposed to be. And we went right back to a little hotel that we were staying at and I put out took three pieces of paper out and wrote a note to the search committees at University of Washington, Franklin and Marshall and Davidson, handwritten, and withdrew my name. And I'll bet you $10 that that's the first time anybody's withdrawn their name from Davidson on a piece of stationery from a Hilton. So, 
uh, it's just a, it's a remarkable school. It's very small. It's uh, about 1,100 students. It's on a hilltop outside the city of Birmingham. Uh, I don't, I, when I come to school like this, I don't normally talk about the school because I, my, my mission is the students. My mission is you all out here. But it's a great school. It's a great school. Who else? Yes, sir, in the green. Uh, you're a yes, the question was, do I have a favorite president that I serve under? Each one of them brought something really special into my life and into the, the way I think. Uh, president Reagan uh, was a remarkable man from the standpoint of what you saw was what you got. He was honest, he cared about people, he cared about this nation, he was deeply devoted to his wife. It was just, he, he was a, just a, a very special man. Bush 41, Bush the Elder, probably came to the presidency knowing more about how to be a president than anybody that has ever had the job. I mean, he had such a varied uh, span of, of jobs within and without the government. that when he came, he really hit the ground running and, and was very good at uh, bringing coalitions together, just getting things done. President uh, Clinton was probably as smart is any of them uh, that I served on. I mean, he was whip class smart. Uh, very, very personal. When you talk to uh, President Clinton, you feel that you're actually, he's the only one in the room, and you're the only one in the room, and you're talking about I mean, he get that laser look at it. He had a flaw that caused him great trouble. And uh, a flaw that will haunt him, you know, for the rest of his life. Uh, each one of them, though, had had their own special. I, I think if I was to name my favorite, it would probably be uh, President Reagan, just because he was so genuine. Who else? Come on, gang. Yes, sir. That's a great question. Who inspired? Uh, I, I guess I would be remiss if I didn't say that my mom and dad were the biggest inspiration for me. My father was also in the military. My mother basically raised, we had three, three boys in our family. She raised us. Uh, he, he went away to World War II and came back after the war. Several years later, he went to Korea and didn't come back until after the war. And so the person who was really responsible for raising us was my mother. And so she was a great inspiration. My dad was a great inspiration. And then later on in life, uh, I had a, a dear friend who still is a dear friend who's always been an inspiration to me. He, in, in this instance, was a contemporary though, and became uh, an individual that I call just about every day. We talk to each other just about every day. Uh, and I consider him a moral compass. So as I start to, if my moral compass starts going off, you know, even a degree, I know that he's gonna get on. That's a good thing to have. Yes, sir. Yeah, the question was, what thoughts go around a person's head when, I guess, when you're in combat? Uh, the, the first thought is, uh, what am I doing here? <laughs> what am I doing here? Uh, it's interesting, combat is, a, is a, affects different people in different ways, but I think most people, when, when they first go into combat, they have this great fear. You, the fear, interestingly enough, is not, am I going to be safe? The fear is, am I going to look, am I going to let somebody down? Am I going to look like a coward? It's not, am I a coward? Because all of us are cowards. Very few of us are just impervious to fear. It's, do you show that fear to a point that other people around you capture it, or do you let them down? So the biggest 
concern I think everybody has is, am I going to let down the person on my right or my left? The second that first bullet goes over your head, any fear for your life goes away. I mean, it is what it is. It's going to happen or it's not going to happen. And at that point, you're, it's all, almost automatic and you just are, you take your training and you, you go for it. You're well trained. That's an important part. There's a difference, gents, between training and education. Between training and education. You go to a school where a classroom is as big as this. You have 200, 300 people in a class, and your professor's down here, and that professor is showing you a lab experiment. The reality is you're probably getting trained. Training is preparation for the expected. Education is preparation for the unexpected. And this world is filled with the unexpected. So while you're at a school where you have such a small student-teacher ratio, you are being educated. Take advantage of that. Because some of you will go to a school where all you get is training. Yes, yes, sir. Pardon me? Well, I regret dropping out of high school. That's for darn sure. Uh, I ended up getting a high school diploma from Exeter, but uh, I I lost basically two years because I lost the year I dropped out, and then I lost the year because Exeter put me back because I hadn't been studying. So yes. We have time for one. One more question. So then you get the word. What's up? Any word, sure. Or a shirt. Um, you know who did the browser and the trap? What is it? Well, you know who did the browser and the trap? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. Can you share the information? No. <laughs> no. You should figure, you, you figure out who we just deal with. What? What? Yeah. Well, it depends on who's going to be left. I mean, it depends on. We're going to take the best athletes, but you're right. We desperately need a quarterback. And with that, thank you very much.
the upper school, 9th to 10th grade, they have class.